in this week's In Ear Insights, can you believe what you read in the news? So this past weekend, there was a news story that I saw in, I think it was either Bloomberg or Business Insider saying that um, <clears throat> on Twitter in particular, uh, the uh, increase in the usage of various uh, racial and, and other slurs was up. I think the news story said 500% since the takeover of uh, Twitter and its new under, its, under its new management. And as soon as I read that, I said, is that true? Could we verify that? Because, yeah, I mean, sometimes you see a lot of stuff in the news that being very uh, a performative sort of clickbaity stuff. And so I, I asked the question, is that true? So, Katie, when you see a story in the news, particularly a story where they, there's a, a, a big data point as the, the, the headline, what do you think? Oh, I mean, the news, like... I usually err on the side of I don't know that that's true until I can see other similar or author authoritative sources reporting the same kind of information. Um, and so obviously I saw, you know, your analysis over the weekend, Chris, but I also saw that same analysis uh, being picked up by larger publications from a quote unquote third party uh, social media research agency, which I had never heard of before. Um, which isn't to say anything, I haven't heard of everything, but it was one of those, like, if this is being picked up and this is such a big deal, has anyone ever heard of this agency before? Um, you know, and I didn't dig too far into the uh, article because it was pretty depressing, but, you know, it's what was the meth, you know, the first thing I would look for if I was trying to validate it myself is, you know, have they been explicitly clear about the methodology? Do they have a website that... Uh, help shed some light on who they are, what their values are, those kinds of things. You know, so if I'm looking at a data point from an agency I've never heard from before, that's a couple of the things I start to look for first. And also which publications are picking up this uh, particular set of data. So for example, I first saw that analysis, not yours, the other one on Yahoo News. Now, I don't know if Yahoo News is... A trustworthy site or not. I mean, I think of Yahoo as, you know, as outdated as AOL, but I could be wrong. So I certainly have some research to do in this, in that instance. Um, you know, I don't have the skill set to rerun the analysis myself, but that's something that I would probably assume would be a good idea for most people who have that kind of resource. Well, and that's a really good point. So this is the the data that we pulled. So what we did is we queried the, the Twitter API directly. Said, okay, here's this this one uh, offensive racial slur. Just show me the number of raw occurrences. And you can obviously see in the five days preceding uh, the weekend, they, you know, they, it, it still occurs. Obviously, it's you know, Twitter's a big place. Uh, but then you can see a, a definite atypical pattern that emerged when the story first came out was on Friday, uh, Friday night, and then into Saturday. And then, of course, you see, you know, the, the huge spike on Saturday and a smaller but still significant spike on Sunday. So this raises the very interesting question. If you want to validate a news story, obviously, if you have the skills and you know the ability to query an API directly and, and do data visualization, you should because it's it's a good idea to get in the habit of validating news sources because you know, again, a lot of news companies make their money on page views and page views have to come from inciting strong emotions. But what if you don't have those skills? Like in, in your case, Katie, you you don't have the ability to write R code and stuff. How would you? How would you go about validating or trying to validate that that's real? Well, as I had mentioned, um, I would start to look at the source of the, you know, the data analysis. You know, is this a company that anyone's ever heard of before? So I do have some ability to do research on companies and sort of see, like, are they legit? <clears throat> you know, what kind of traffic do they get? What kind of inbound links do they get? Who's linking to their stuff? So I do have those resources uh, through various SEO tools. And I feel like, uh, you know, if you are, you know, a low level marketer like myself, where, you know, you know, the basics, you can use the tools, that's a good place to start, because you can at least validate that 
a source of news or, or a website is, you know, they, it's not just something that somebody stood up that day uh, just to sort <clears throat> of like publish some false data. And so you can start to validate it that way. And then you can start to look at, is there anyone else talking about this? So a lot of the search, uh, a lot of the social media tools have that search built in. So start looking for that particular data source, like that agency or whoever created it and see like, are they a legit agency? Are other people, you know, resharing this? Who are the people who are resharing this? And so it's interesting, Chris, um, you know, so if you pull up your analysis again, and if you're just listening to this, you can see this on uh, trustinsights.ai slash YouTube. Um, that what strikes me and a lot of the conversations that I saw on Twitter over the weekend were people quote unquote testing the system in terms of censorship. And so part of me wonders uh, if that anomaly spike was people trying to see if they truly were allowed to say whatever they felt like, and they were just using one of the most, you know, hateful and offensive terms they could think of in order to see if the new owner of Twitter would actually ban them or not. Um, now, that's not to say that, that that's an okay way to test the system, but based on a lot of the chatter that I saw, I'm wondering if that's what the anomaly is. Um, and unfortunately, an analysis like this doesn't give that context to see like what the words were around it. And that would be the next piece of information I would start to look for is what additional context exists for an analysis like this. Because if you were to put this out there and just say, and this is what's on Twitter right now with no additional context, I think that would be very irresponsible because you're not saying that, uh, you know, the red line on this graph represents a chain of ownership the conversations started to look like this. These are the, you know, near terms around these other, you know, hateful words. And so getting a better understanding of what this actually represents versus, you know, everybody and their mother started to use the N word and this is what happened. And if that's the case, that's fine. But I feel like you would need more evidence to prove that that's what was happening. Right. And it's interesting. Um, late last night, uh, the interim... Uh, head of the trust and safety team said that no no moderation rules had changed and that they had, that that really big spike um, was a bot storm. Uh, it was a, a a bot network at work. Um, however, uh, the other spikes are not necessarily that to be the case. Uh, to your point, and and this is something that you know we have that data. Like we collected the raw data itself, and one of the things that. Uh, I've been thinking about is like, do we just take that data, um, bundle it up, and put it out as a, you know as a GitHub repository, saying anyone anyone is welcome to look at the raw data um, because mm -hmm. analyzing hate speech is not one of our services uh, as a company. Uh, you know, it's certainly something I did obviously did on my free time, but it's also not something that I want to invest you know hours and hours and hours uh, mm -hmm. developing. Uh, more advanced uh, language processing for it, but I could open source it and say, here's the data, do with it what you will. Um, all of this is from the public timelines. This is not, you know, this mm -hmm. does not contain any private data. It does contain person identifying information. Um, but to your point, you know, publishing this, because we published, I published this, um, I think it was Saturday, Friday or Saturday. I don't remember even now when I published it, but um, it obviously did get a fair bit of attention with, with the data we had available at the time. In those cases where you are somebody who cares about a, a topic or something that you see in the news, if you don't have those capabilities and you've done the basics of what you can, right? You've you know, said mm -hmm. like, okay, we've we've looked into you know whoever this Chris Penn character is and you know and, and this Trust Insights company. Okay, they look like they're they're a real company. Mm -hmm. What's your next step for saying? Can I? How do how do I validate this? Is it just going to the person who posted and saying, hey, can you share your sources? Or how how do you go about digging deeper without you know a, a coder on hand well i think that that's exactly it so if let's say i was the editor of a major publication and i saw that you know this guy chris penn shared this really interesting data point and i wanted to cover it that would be my first stop in terms of due diligence is like hey let me talk to the person who created this and say how did you do this what are your sources and so i actually did see a lot of people uh, in the conversation, asking about your methodology, like, what does this contain? Did it, 
you know, was it this, was it that? And I felt like that was really responsible on their part to get a better understanding of the context behind. Because again, when you're looking at this without any context, you're just looking at basically single data points plotted day over day. And you don't really have any other information. And it can tell a story, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So that's where I would start. So let's say, you know, uh, I saw John posting some really interesting data on a social network or somewhere else. My responsibility would be to say, hey, John, um, can you help me understand how you, where did you get this data? Did you, you know, do it yourself? Did you borrow it from someone else? You know, how, if I wanted to use this, how would I cite it? What would be the methodology that I would put? Because every time you reshare data that you don't know where it came from, you know, you risk, you run the risk of sharing false information. And so you yourself, your personal responsibility is to make sure that you understand, you know, can I trust and can I validate the data that I'm looking at? How can I believe what I'm reading? And that's it. You need to do the work and not just blindly share based on a headline. And I think that that's one of the things that a lot of people have been doing over the past few days, or even, you know, since the Years. dawn of, you know, forever, you know, just resharing information without fully reading the article or fully understanding the whole story. They're just, you know, spreading gossip and, you know, just clicking the like and reshare button without really mm -hmm. understanding, is this something I meant to reshare? I think the same thing happened when uh, Twitter did a massive round of layoffs, there was a lot of retweets and reshares without fully reading like the full thread of something. I saw a couple of those posts of like the, oops, I don't have an undo button. About 10 years ago, IBM came up with this idea of the, the citizen analyst and was later pivoted into mm -hmm. sort of the citizen data scientist. And it was a concept that was good, it was a good idea, but it never took off. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that... Uh, ordinary people could pick up analytics tools and and do stuff like this. You know, when you mm. see a news story, uh, validate it. Do you think? Do you think there's still merit in that idea? And how realistic is it? Especially since we are now in what uh, Jay Bear recently called in one of his newsletters, the, living in the post factual world where facts don't matter anymore, just opinions. You know, I do think it still matters because I think that empowering people to do their own research is a good thing. Now, here's where there's that like, that asterisk disclaimer of, you know, just because I look at this data and you look at this data, Chris, doesn't mean we walk away with the same insights or takeaways. And I think that that's the disclaimer. <clears throat> so let's say I had the skill set to pull this data myself. And let's say, and this is full disclosure, totally not true. This is a made up example for the sake of the conversation let's say I was a roaring racist and I looked at this and said, okay, this is great. This is good news. This is positive. You and I just looked at the exact same data set and had two very different reactions. And so I might look at this and go, great. Now I can go get all of my, you know, similarly racist friends, get them to join Twitter because now this is a great place where I can be spreading this hate speech. And again, that is a completely made up fact about me that is not true at all i actually am really sickened by what i'm seeing i think that it's a horrible thing but for the sake of argument that is a made-up example so i feel like yes the idea of a citizen analyst is a good idea with the caveat that it can be a positive and a negative a negative in the sense that just because somebody can get their hands on the data doesn't mean they will do with it the exact same that you will do with it yeah, I think the the two obstacles that the idea ran into, one was the the skills, right? Mm -hmm. Because even with the best tools, the skills to do data analysis well are are very difficult to teach. Um, particularly your methodology, rigor, statistical relevance, things like that. Those are all things that are critical to go, doing good data analysis mm -hmm. and uh, that requires, you know, uh, education. And two, the point you raise is a really important one, which is in, like I said, in, in J Bear's uh, you know, post factual world, mm -hmm. what's more likely to happen is that people will cherry pick the data that tells the story that they want to have told. Mm -hmm. um, 
you, not even you know in, in the example you were talking about, just saying you know whether or not this is a, a victory for free speech or not, which is what um, some of the folks are saying about it. Mm-hmm. You, that's not even manipulating the data. And in right. a lot of the cases, there are people who have, and this is true of news publications too. People will manipulate data to fit the story rather than mm-hmm. manipulate the story to fit the data. And that level of ethics, uh, professional ethics, uh, is again something that the citizen data scientist, the citizen analyst, will not have. Just like the citizen blogger. Uh, or the citizen YouTuber does not have the same constraints that a, a professional publication does. A, a person can go up on YouTube and say all kinds of crazy things like the world is flat and not round, <laughs> right? And there's no consequence to this because uh, they do not have any of the same journalistic you know, uh, integrity. However, what we're seeing in the media landscape, obviously, is that seems to matter less to folks who want to see and hear things that uh, agree with their point of view. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's you know, some of the reasons why the citizen data scientist stuff uh, never really went anywhere. Do you think there's a place for, I don't know, um, like a, a guild or a, a volunteer organization or something that would fulfill the same role, you know, not asking individual, you know, randos to, to try and do, <laughs> you know, generalized mm-hmm. additive models, but, professionals who want to do something in their spare time um, and would be willing to say, yes, we're going to sign off on doing this right. We're not going to get paid for it, but we're going to do it right so that when somebody in, you know, sees a news story, there's, there's, I wouldn't call it professional fact checking, but there's, there's somebody else providing some validation of data points. Well, and I think that that's sort of the purpose of those, you know, third party research firms, that's what they're meant to do. And so, you know, It's, you know, it's interesting because it's the exact same challenge of, you know, humans programming artificial intelligence and algorithms, unless you have a fully representative committee that is unbiased and or willing to understand their biases, then you're never going to get, you know, the perfect algorithm or the perfect, you know, data set or training data. And I feel like this is the exact same case. And so, who then gets to validate that these people, these volunteers for this citizen analyst committee are then, you know, not having their own biased and, you know, secret hidden agendas when they're publishing the data. And so it is, it's a really tricky question that doesn't have a great answer. And so the, I would say, you know, and I don't mean to, for this to sound sort of like disheartening, but the best that you can do for yourself in terms of whether or not you can trust what you're reading and, you know, validate the information mm-hmm. is to do your own due diligence. And that doesn't mean, you know, pulling out your machine learning, you know, programming, coding things, but it's really just understanding who's behind putting this data together. And are they someone mm-hmm. that you feel like, you know, if you were, I don't know, gosh, you know, asked to speak about under oath, like you would feel comfortable speaking the truth of like, yes, I fully believe that this data is represented in a way that I, you know, understand it, and I can stand behind it. Um, You know, and again, it comes down to sort of your own personal beliefs, like, in that really terrible example, Chris, we could be looking at the exact same data set, and have very different beliefs about it. But at the end of the day, the data itself was correct. And are just our opinions in that bad example just would have been different about what the data is saying. We need to get like a headbands or hairbands for ourselves that like have devil horns so we can have like the evil version of ourselves. <sighs> yeah, to fully represent like, okay, so now I'm pretending that I am the evil opposite version. Exactly, um, or goatee, like that's what they did in Star Trek. Something, but well, that wouldn't work for me. But and I do, again, sort of, and now I'm, like, nervous, like, full-on disclosure, like, that was a made-up no, no, no. example. No, no, no we, we, get we get that. I know that. you know that, Chris, but I want to make sure everybody <laughs> knows that. I'm, I, we're getting devil hair, man. So that's, <laughs> that's what we're going to do. Um, what is the obligation of professional organizations like Trust Insights as a company um, with societal topics like this? Because there are, if you look at the most recent CMO survey, there is something like still like 40-ish percent of organizations, of CMOs that said they don't want their brands getting involved in anything mm-hmm. even moderately polarizing. 
as from your perspective as the CEO of the company, what is our, if any, our professional obligation towards stuff that ain't going to make us money, um, mm -hmm. but does some level of social good? I think the the data that you shared makes sense because at our core, we do natural language processing. We do data analysis in order to help people make their own decisions. Um, so I don't feel like that was out of line in terms of what we do. Now, again, is it a service? Yes, natural language processing is a service. Data analysis is a service. And at the end of the day, data is data. Now, as companies are trying to decide their position on, you know, these kinds of conversations, it you really need to take a step back and say, do I have a place in this conversation? I, as a human, probably have strong opinions, you know, one way or the other about the conversation. But do my opinions align with the mission and values of the company that I work for, or I own, or whatever the case is? Um, you know, and will my opinions in the conversation add any value or am I just in an echo chamber of everybody else is saying the same thing and I want to, you know, just sort of like stick my finger in there and go, yeah, 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 yeah. That's me too, which doesn't really add any value. And I think so it's tough. It's a really tough place right now for companies to navigate in terms of knowing what's right and what's wrong because a lot of people don't want to hear from the companies mm. unless you're a company like, Adidas, and you have a very public person who was saying things like, I can say whatever I want, I can say anti-Semitic things, and I will not be let go from this contract. And everybody was calling for Adidas to make a decision. And they did. They finally did. And unless we work there, we don't really know what happened behind the scenes. And so that was a very clear cut case where the company needed to make a decision and say something publicly. But in this case, you know, Twitter, you know, we can all have opinions about it, but Twitter are the ones who need to make the decision. And unfortunately the person who's in charge is the one who's fostering all of this hate speech and negative conversation. And so we as companies, we as individuals, can choose what we do with the information, but we don't need to propel the negativity any further. You said something interesting in there um, about companies and, you know, and sort of the, the brands and the values and things like that. In a post-factual world where opinion matters more than fact and where, mm -hmm. where that, you know, having those points of views um, really determines how people see the world, do you think that do you think that is what is driving consumers to make you know more uh, value based choices uh, for brands? Say like I will not you know shop with this brand and stuff because mm -hmm. they don't reflect my values anymore, and because now in a post factual world I place a lot more value on my opinion, and you know therefore which brands align with it and which don't, and if so, then does that make doing this kind of work more of a strategic imperative after all? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think that, you know, brands don't necessarily need to get involved in, you know, all of the noise that's on a social platform. However, they do need to make sure that their mission and their values are clearly stated in their assets, on their website, that they are, you know, following them with all of their actions. And so when someone, a consumer, you know, someone who's looking to hire that brand, that agency starts looking at, okay, what is, is this a company that believes in sustainability, but also, you know, behaves in a way that they show they believe in sustainability, for example. Okay, then that's a company that I can get behind versus this is a company that says that they believe in a greener world of sustainability, but yet they are still underpaying factory workers in, you know, terrible conditions. So clearly, you know, words written on their website have no meaning. And so again, it goes back to you as the consumer needing to do, to do your own due diligence and the responsibility of the companies is to not only talk the talk, but walk the walk and your actions as a company need to reflect yeah. the things that you say you're publicly going to do. So for example, if you say in your values, 
we will, you know, publicly come out against hate speech, then yeah, you need to be part of that conversation. Um, but if your, you know, values are, we believe in a more sustainable world, maybe you don't necessarily need to partake. You just need to keep sort of like towing the line and moving in the direction that is appropriate for you. So for us, uh, obviously, you know, me as an individual person, you know, have some level of curiosity in this particular uh, set of data. Um, sure. What, what, if anything, would you say would be sort of next steps? You know, is this just a, a curiosity that blows over with the news cycle and you know, whatever happens today in the news you know, takes precedence? Or is this something that becomes part of, part of what either I do individually or we do as a company? You know, I think that based on what we do as a company and the things that are, fall into our values, it's not inappropriate for us to at least continue to educate on here's what the data looks like. Here's a summation of the conversations. Um, I don't think that that's inappropriate at all, as long as we don't, you know, take it too far down the line and start telling people how they should feel about it. Our job, our goal our company is built on educating people on what the data says, not telling them how to feel about it. And so I don't think that it's inappropriate for us to continue to do that. I do think we don't, we want to make sure we don't cross that line and say, and this is exactly how you should feel about it as well. Like that's not our place at all. Right. Yeah. Which, which I reflected, I think in the, in the original post, which was, here's the data. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to tell you how to think, you know, how you should feel about it, but here it is. Right. And that's exactly it. That's our responsibility is helping people understand what's happening. All right. So to wrap up, if you see data uh, being used heavily in some kind of news story, mm -hmm. your, your first steps should be to validate whether or not the, the news source itself is trustworthy, whether mm -hmm. the data provider is trustworthy, if you've ever heard of it. And then, if you have the capability or if you have uh, friends or colleagues who have the capability and you've got the time and, and it's something you really care about, it might be worth you know, commissioning your own uh, extraction and analysis of the data to see if A, what's in the news story is accurate or even close to accurate. And then B, what are the nuances that didn't get reported? Mm. Um, and if this if this topic in particular of hate speech uh, within uh, social networks is something of interest to you and you want to talk more about it, pop on over to our free Slack group. You know, we talk about analytics of all kinds and mm -hmm. societal stuff, social good stuff is, is not off the table as long as it's done in a respectful manner. Uh, mm -hmm. Pop on over to trustinsights.ai slash analytics for marketers where you and over 2,800 other marketers are asking and answering each other's questions every single day. And wherever it is that you choose to watch or listen to this show, if there's a channel you'd rather have it on instead, go to trustinsights.ai slash TI podcast. And if you like the show, please leave us a, a rating or a review. We appreciate it. It helps, uh, helps more people find the show. Thanks for uh, tuning in today, and we'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.